All right, so um, welcome everyone uh, to uh, uh, this lecture in the lecture series of the Collaborative Research uh, Center, but at the same time a lecture at the Department of Geography and somehow we will combine interests from uh, both sides. I have the pleasure to introduce to you our uh, speaker uh, today, uh, Professor Ian Schoons from the Institute for Development Studies in Brighton and one of the three directors of the uh, STEPS Centre um, at the University of Sussex uh, in Brighton in England. Um, and a few words about uh, the background of uh, Professor Schoons before I hand over to him because we are all very uh, curious to uh, learn more about uncertainty and what it means for our lives, especially um, the people who have been with me in uh, my uh, class this morning. Where, where are you? I don't see them. Here you are. Okay, all over. Uh, so they are, they are very curious. Um, we, they were all very troubled with uh, <laughs> uncertainty. Uh, we lost the security in uh, our future visions uh, this morning in the discussions. Well, a few words about um, uh, Ian Schoons and where he came from. Uh, in uh, Schoons is an, is an interesting example of, uh, of a scholar who somehow has migrated through disciplines. So from what I know about you, um, in, uh, your, your first degree was in biology. The second one, uh, the master's degree was in environmental management. You did your PhD on livestock and households in Zimbabwe, uh, in Africa. And from there, somehow you, you moved into development studies in a very particular field where uh, you are one of the, um, the leading um, persons, perhaps even the leading scholar um, in, uh, in research about uh, sustainable livelihoods and the sustainable livelihood framework that um, every one of you who has already done a bachelor's thesis knows. And I'm, I'm sure that there are some uh, in this room who have actually done their bachelor's thesis based based on the Sustainable Livelihoods Framework. That is one of um, the specialties of uh, Ian Schoon's work. A second one is pastoralism and um, the, the, um, the project from which um, uh, part of the material he is going to talk about today comes is actually a, a project that was uh, focusing on pastoralism in different parts of the world. So that's an, an, an empirical uh, focus. A third um, area of special Specialization is a regional area, Zimbabwe. I think I don't say too much about that. I know you're also doing a lot of research in Ethiopia and other parts of Africa, um, but Zimbabwe somehow is your second home country. And um, then this um, topic of today it comes out of a research um, that you have been doing at the STEP Center over the past um, 10 years almost, I think, which is concerned with uh, pathways to uh, sustainable development. And sustainability has a lot to do on the one hand with risk, but on the other hand also with uncertainty. And that is the topic uh, we are going to hear more about in the coming something like 45 minutes. We'll have um, time for a discussion afterwards and then um, after I would say something like a half an hour, 40 minutes of discussion, we can continue the discussion outside so um, we are already preparing for some beer and brezels so the first ones who run out of the room will be able to grab a bottle of beer, the others will only get water. So if I give the signal um, everything is over you may just head outside and there will also be some Britzel outside. Okay, uh, Ian, I'm very glad uh, you made it um, uh, through, the, uh, through the tunnel um, to Bonn and Cologne and I'm looking forward to, to your lecture. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Detlef, and thank you everybody for coming. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here and a pleasure to interact with the Collaborative Research Centre and the Department of Geography here because I think there are a lot of uh, themes that you're all engaged with which very much overlap with the sort of things that I want to discuss. So in this particular lecture I want to make the argument that if we put this idea of uncertainty at the centre of our thinking and practice, this means that we have to really quite fundamentally rethink what we mean by development. Uh, it challenges the way we think and do. Equally, with uncertainty somehow situated between 
the present and the future mediated through negotiations of knowledge, of materiality, of experience, of embodiment, of practice and so on. I also want to argue that uncertainty fundamentally affects our imaginations of the future and therefore of direct relevance to the, to the centre. But as I'll try and show, um, and I don't think it will be news to many of you, we're rather stuck at the moment in a very linear, mechanistic, technocratic mode of development that fails to address what one could see as an increasing dynamic complexity in today's turbulent world. And this, I argue, is problematic and sometimes actually dangerous. Now, through the talk, as, as Detlev mentioned, I want to share with you a number of examples from research engagements that I'm involved in and want to make the case that taking, particularly want to make the case that taking seriously those who live with and from uncertainty, often in quite marginal settings, is really key for our, this rethinking of development and reimagining futures that I'm arguing for. And I want to illustrate that through our work on pastoralism. But I want to cast the net more broadly and suggest that actually those insights don't stop at the edge of pastoral zones of Africa or wherever, that actually this, uh, this, uh, these insights from these settings are more generally relevant to encountering uncertainties in a whole range of domains uh, way beyond development. <coughs> so. Uncertainties are everywhere. I don't have to uh, explain that to all of you, whether we think about the political situations within which we live, certainly coming from the UK, uncertainty is one of the watchwords on the news on a daily basis. But uncertainties, almost as Helga Novotny described it in her book, are written into the script, uh, the script of life the unpredictable unknowns that confront us on a daily basis. So whether that's climate change, finance systems, critical infrastructures, migration flows, epidemic disease outbreaks, all of these uncertainties continuously undermine the neat, simple ways policies and institutions are designed on a quite fundamental basis. So what do I mean by uncertainty? Or, in the words of Andy Sterling, my colleague at the SEP Centre, the more encompassing term, incertitude. And I want to argue that there are four different dimensions to incertitude following Andy's work. And I want to illustrate this with an example from a pastoral area, in this case Isiolo in Kenya, northern Kenya. So first, risk. Risk where we know both the probabilities of outcomes and their likelihoods, um, where we can assess in a calculative way the likelihood of a particular outcome happening through prob probability assessment. So for example, in building a road, engineers use probabilistic risk assessments to assess uh, whether bridges collapse or don't collapse, whether roads function or don't function. Relatively straightforward engineering response to risk. But I want to argue that this is actually a, a, a small element of a variety of different other problems. Let's take uncertainty, where we actually don't know the likelihoods of things happening. So whether that's a drought, for example, we really don't know. Despite all the increases in the effectiveness of climate forecasting and general circulation models and all the rest of it, downscaling to particular areas, for example in northern Kenya, we still don't know whether a risk, or in this case a massive flood, will happen year on year. It's uncertain in that sense. We know the, we know the outcome, but we don't know the likelihood of that happening. There's also the situation of ambiguity, where we might know the likelihoods of different options, but actually there's a debate about the outcomes between different actors. They're high, being highly contested. So in a pastoral area, for example, it could be used for uh, the grazing of camels, a pastoral production system. It could also be used for tourism and conservation. It could also be used for infrastructure development. There's ambiguity in there about the nature of the outcomes. 
contestation here, questions of fairness, of justice, of distribution, who wins, who loses, come to the fore, way beyond an engineering assessment, for example. And finally, there's a condition of ignorance where, in the words of former US Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, there are unknown unknowns, the ones we don't know, we don't know. And he knew that all too well. You're extremely exposed when things are indeterminate. And indeed, expanding knowledge, especially when there's incommensurable perspectives competing with each other, may actually only increase ignorance. So thinking about these four sectors, it's actually the three quadrants outside the risk box, if you like, uh, uncertainty, ambiguity, ignorance, that I would argue are the most common. Um, most situations in development contexts, and more broadly, I would suggest, are not amenable to simple risk management where we can calculate probabilities and model outcome likelihoods. So that presents a problem. Yet, the institutions and practices conditioned by politics and power, what Michel Foucault would call practices of governmentality, almost inevitably close down towards risk. So on this slide are some examples from pastoral, uh, pastoral development. You could choose your field, water management, forest management, wherever, whatever you're working on. Plans, models, insurance products, goals, metrics, indicators, all attempt to seek closure, pushing us often dangerously to in, towards a zone of risk where knowledge and outcomes are assumed to be known, or at least thought to be able to be estimated. So let me offer an example. There's much excitement these days about technological-led de uh, development approaches to climate adaptation in pastoral areas. Mobile phones with climate predictors, insurance products linked to index-based payouts. And by definition, these outcomes are specified in terms of predicted uh, probabilities based on models and liability assessments. Now, it would be fine if these predictions were accurate, but of course, inevitably, they're not because of uncertainty. So relying on this type of removed, uh, expert-led, market-based system, um, some argue, actually can increase vulnerability, undermining local responses attuned to uncertainty. So there's a danger in this closing down to risk. I want to argue. So does this have to be? Do we have to always be wedded to a risk management approach? Why does uncertainty get obliterated from our thinking? For that, we have to look at the history of professional practices and institutions, particularly in the West, uh, and styles of development that we become used to, and see where they've come from. But actually, to see alternatives, we also need to dig a bit deeper, which is what I'll argue now. So for many, development, so-called, the project of development, started with Harry Truman's speech in 1945, a big state-led normative aspiration for change post-World War II, a Marshall Plan for the world, as it were. And then later, of course, with the turn to neoliberalism, the Washington Consensus emerged, shifted from a vision of states to markets. But what was similar about these two visions, of course, is that they were very much about control, about offsetting risks, about managing progress and trajectories towards a modernist vision in a particular way. But that's a very narrow vision of development's history. And I rather like this book, which is actually quite old now, by Cowan and Shenton, called Doctrines of Development, which suggests a, a much deeper history to our understanding of what development is about. And they argue that back in the 18th, 19th century in Europe, there was arguments, for example, from Auguste Comte, um, rooted in a very different understanding around cycles of change, of growth, destruction, renewal. Not a linear view of development, but actually a much more dynamic view of development, rooted in ideas of collective trusteeship. Totally different paradigm. But this was somewhat obliterated later on with the evolutionist ideas that came from Darwinism. The idea that there was a, a linear trajectory towards a particular view of modernity. 
interpretations of Charles Darwin's arguments. And this was reinforced by the Industrial Revolution in, in Europe and, and the popularity of evolutionary ideas around progress that became central. And of course, Rostow's book on economic growth, stages of, stages versions, you know, mirrored these evolutionary styled approaches. And it's this version, this simplistic linear version, uh, that has framed Western notions of development, ex exported through colonial and post-colonial projects of aid and investment, blueprint plans, modernization, and so on. You know the story. But the argument about having a historical perspective, of course, is it needn't be so. There are alternative inspirations, even in Western uh, philosophical thought, and certainly expanded beyond that to non-Western thought, where uncertainty, lack of control, uh, is more central. And of course, even in the intellect core intellectual ideas of Western perspectives on science and economics, uncertainty has been a central tenet of discussion. Has been in the past. These are quotes from Nobel Prize winners and sort of leading uh, economists and scientists writing over the last hundred years. And note the dates here. They're quite old. But they all, in different ways, have made the argument that, that, that a perspective on uncertainty has to be central to the conduct of science and the conduct of economics and the conduct of our thinking. Yet it was only really in the technocratic planning vision of when the technocratic planning vision of development took over, particularly in the, from the 1960s, that disciplines narrowed such perspectives where uncertainty was central have increasingly been lost. And I think this is the case certainly in research. It's perhaps even more so in teaching. Just look at any standard disciplinary textbook in the index. See if there's any reference to uncertainty. Often virtually nothing other than uncertainty being a problem. Barely a mention. So there are intellectual traditions to draw on, and I think this matters as we reconstitute an intellectual and practical agenda to put uncertainty more centrally in our thinking and practice. Given the nature of uncertain conditions that we face and the failure of policies and institutions to address them, this is potentially a big problem. And a large reason, actually, why most development, qua development uh, projects, fails. Yet across a variety of different fields, we see the beginnings, and I, su I suggest it's really only the beginnings, of a realisation that uncertainty must be embraced and brought back into the conversation. Now, I want to give you three very quick examples from very diverse settings to, uh, to illustrate this. My first, and you'll think this is bizarre, me suggesting this, is from finance and banking. So the 2008 financial crash, which hit the global uh, finance system, particularly in Western countries, is has resulted in actually, I think, some quite important reflections amongst economists and others, uh, including some of those on, in the books on the, on the right-hand side, um, of thinking about, well, why did this happen? How on earth could the foundations of capitalism be subjected to such a, an, a, an uncertain set of, uh, of conditions? The chief economist of the Bank of England, uh, Andy Haldane, reflected in a really nice paper on, uh, on this very question. Why the conventional approach, highlighted in the middle column there, um, in forms of voluntary regulation, individualized accountability, had really failed. His paper, Rethinking the Financial Network, argued processes of securitization resulted in the network becoming complex, dense, and opaque, with diversi diversification generating heightened system-wide uncertainty. The result, of course, as we know, was the crash, and he argues that the, cri the crisis was rooted in what he called an exaggerated sense of knowledge and control within that system. 
He and others are, have argued, therefore, that new forms of regulation are required that increase transparency and collective accountability in such systems, focusing the cultures and practices, uh, focusing on the cultures and practices of key actors. Markets and banking and finance systems associated with them are constructed, of course, through social relations. These matter even when the transactions that are occurring are happening within nanoseconds across globally uh, connected computer networks. So I think some of these reflections in banking and finance suggest that taking uncertainty seriously is absolutely key. The same is applied in thinking about critical infrastructures. Um, think energy supply systems, air traffic control operations, and so on. Again, slightly left field subject area for many of you, but actually thinking out of the box um, can be helpful sometimes. Again, in the middle, the conventional approach. A control orientated engineering approach based very much on technical, managerial risk management. Remember that diagram closing down to risk at the top left hand corner? That's the standard approach of dealing with these things. But actually, and this has been exposed by a colleague Emery Rowe and others, we're looking at energy supply systems in California. Um, arguing for a, what they call a mess and reliability approach, the practice is very different. Reliability isn't engendered by these engineering responses, these technocratic responses. It's, en it's engendered through particular professionals in such, such systems who recognize collectively that failure is uh, unacceptable and reliability generated through proactive intervention uh, is absolutely vital. So reliability professionals of the scientists, the engineers, the IT professionals, the suppliers, the regulators and others who keep that system running. Many of these responses are below the radar, informal, using tacit experiential knowledge people's own case studies, people's own scenario analysis, their pattern recognition skills, all essential, they argue. And is this pro professionalism not based on control-based engineering, but based on uh, reliability professionals that keeps the system um, going? So think of the systems that you work in. Is it the engineering systems and the plans and the blueprints that keeps the system going? Or is it the people who are managing things on the ground on a day-to-day -day basis. A similar story arises in another area of study, um, thinking about disease outbreaks. Again, two, slightly simplistically again, contrasting perspectives. The conventional approach, again, focused on control-based risk management. Predictive models generating early warning systems, contingency and preparedness plans, leading to a control-based, medicalized, often securitized response. You know the story. All justified as part of one, what one might call a crisis narrative, which obscures the complexities and uncertainties. Yet the experience of the Ebola outbreak in West Africa and more recently in the DRC, avian influenza in Southeast Asia before, has shown that such, again, control-based risk management approaches don't always work. They don't deal with the uncertainties at play, the social relations, the cultural logics, the community interactions at the centre of actual real-time disease outbreak and spread. Reflecting on the Ebola experience, Paul Richards, in the book uh, on the slide there, argues that uh, common sense, improvisation, distributed practical knowledge and collective action are invaluable elements in a people's science of infection control. One that he suggests moves away from um, managerial control-based responses to real-time responses by people in situ. Again, similar lessons to that emerging around um, critical infrastructures. So, three very diverse examples, I could add more, you could add more, and maybe you can suggest more in the discussion, are showing the limits of a risk-based control orientated approach, the top left-hand corner, showing the importance of, of embracing uncertainty and taking it seriously. But they're also suggesting alternative ways of thinking about 
uh, the regulation of market networks, the role of reliability professionals in delivering services, the importance of cultural logics and distributed collective responses. Some key insights from all of these examples are suggesting uh, ways forward. But where can we learn about how to do things better, whether in banking, critical infrastructures, disease, wherever? How to respond to uncertainty more effectively? I'd argue that where we, where we best start our learning is learning from those who, for millennia, have lived with and from uncertainty. So, you may ask, okay, this is getting a bit weird now, what, how is he going to connect thinking about financial derivatives, air traffic control, hurricanes, volcanoes, global disease management, and camels in northern Kenya? But I think, and it's reflected in the research that we're kicking off under this uh, European Research Council grant, um, that learning from pastoralists in situ about how they think about and respond to uncertainties is incredibly, incredibly revealing. I was recalling a discussion with a group of elders in Isiolo uh, last year, who's one of them who said, we don't know the future and what it will bring. Uncertainties are here now. That's our life. So uncertainties are not outside, out there to be controlled. That's part and partal, parcel of, if you like, vernacular experience. So making these connections between these lived, localised, situated experiences and, uh, and other domains is very centrally part and parcel of what this um, ERC-funded project that I lead called Pastres, logo at the top, and indeed actually connects back to work that I did probably before some of you were born um, on pastoralism way back when, that book called Living with Uncertainty. Um, so I want to show, share with you very briefly now in the next section of the talk um, some of the insights that are coming out of this work on pastoralism. And then before I close, connect the two bits of the talk and think about, well, what does this mean for development and our thinking about the future? So, our work on pastoralism is, is as I said, underway. Um, there are six absolutely fantastic PhD students who've joined us at Sussex from different parts of the world who are now in the field learning intensively <coughs> about uh, how people live with and from uncertainty in different settings. In Amdo, Tibet, in China, in Western India, in Gujarat, in Southern Ethiopia, in Burana, in Isiolo in Kenya, as I've already mentioned, in southern Tunisia, and in Sardinia in Italy. Very diverse settings, but all subject to different interacting, intersecting uncertainties around environment and resources, markets and commodities, governance and institutions. So I want to offer you now three very brief examples of the sort of things that we're looking at. Um, and linking back to the themes that, we, that I talked about a little bit earlier. So first, our work in Sardinia um, is raising really important, I think, interesting questions about the role of markets and the construction of market networks in relation to responding to uncertainties. And echoes, in interesting ways, the debates that have been happening um, in the banking and um, the banking and finance community in the wake of the, uh, the, the, the 2008 crash. So we're asking things like how do socially and culturally embedded economic behaviours affect exposures to market volatility? Um, how, is, uh, how is this volatility managed by different types of people engaged in different types of network? Now this is a big issue for pastoralists in Sardinia. Um, because sheep milk production is linked to industrial production of pecorino cheese for export, mostly to the US, where and prices of both milk and fodder fluctuate wildly, making livelihoods of shepherds like this man um, very precarious. But by looking at different types of market network, those um, more linear and exposed um, to these type of global uh, value chain 
uh, fluctuations, and some more diversified and embedded in local economies, we can explore and begin to explore what are the social, cultural, political relations at the heart of these market networks and how these uh, affect people's ability to cope with uncertainty. So just as with bankers and financiers, responding to uncertainty in pastoral Sardinia requires a much more sophisticated approach to thinking about markets than conventional development or agricultural economics, for example, has uh, offered before. It's much more than demand and supply, much more than price setting, much more than value chains or simplistic views of value chains. It's much more about the, po the political and cultural relations that exist within market networks. And those features are the ones that allow some people to be able to ride uncertainties and others not. Moving on, another theme obviously in our studies of pastoralism is mobility not surprising in pastoral settings. So our work in Kenya, this picture is from Kenya, focuses on the importance of, of mobility as a flexible response to uncertainty. Now, of course, this has been long, long recognized in uh, ethnographic studies of transhuman pastoral systems, but the principles of mobility are being applied today in very new ways in pastoralism. Uh, as a result of changing political economies and ecologies in these regions. So, for example, fodder rather than animals may be moved. Uh, herds may be split in new ways. Different combinations of large and small stock, young and old stock may be moved uh, in different ways. And this flexible, mobile response is absolutely crucial in people's ability to survive. So it's not necessarily the classic old nomadic systems, but the principles of mobility are sustained. And all this is often facilitated these days by access to new technologies, mobile phones, uh, new forms of transport, you name it. These are facilitating forms of mobility. Now, understanding mobility in pastoral systems in the past was often the preserve of the sort of classic anthropologist who would go and understand the archaic systems of particular peoples of Africa or whatever. I think understanding mobility in pastoral systems is absolutely pertinent to contemporary issues in Europe and elsewhere. Think about questions of, of migration within, within the European context. What does, what does the imposition of particular migrant statuses or border controls and so on mean for people's ability to cope with uncertainties. How does, do, do, do these debates about mobility and new forms of mobility to facilitate mobility, which is, you know, if you take um, Bauman's idea of us living in these turbulent liquid times, mobility is a central feature of modernity today. It's not an archaic form uh, out there in the pastoral rangelands. So I think we can learn uh, more than a thing or two from pastoralists about this. Third, practical knowledges. I've mentioned this before. Um, this is more than a sort of indigenous knowledge that sometimes is reified. It's more about how people's practical experiential knowledge is applied to new settings. And our work in uh, Amdo Tibet in China is, for example, looking at hybrid institutions that are being constructed about, around land and grazing management. These have to draw on people's own practical experiential knowledges uh, on improvisation and experiment in order for people to be able to adapt and respond to uncertainty. The result is tenure arrangements are not old style standard designs, communal, communal forms, nor are they, as it were, uh, the, the imposed versions of individualized, privatized forms of land ownership. Hybrid arrangements have to be constructed in order to create reliability in the face of uncertainty. So just as with the critical infrastructures, the energy supply systems, for example, this reliability is generated through social networks, building relations and institutions. It requires shared knowledge of system change as well as the immediate conditions. 
Practical, distributed, embedded knowledges linked to plural institutions allows pastoralists in Tibet to respond to a whole array of different uncertainties, climate, markets, impositions from the Chinese state. Uh, there's a whole flood of uncertainties uh, affecting their day-to-day -day lives. So just as those control room operators in critical infrastructure settings um, uh, create reliability in the face of mess and uncertainty, so must these pastoralists. And I think we can learn a lot, again, from pastoralist thinking and practice focused on embracing uncertainty in these ways. Okay, so I've offered you a whole array of different examples, um, including from some from our preliminary work on pastoralism. What does this mean for development, so-called? Now, I started off by saying taking uncertainty seriously in the way that pastoralists must, trading floor bankers must, control room reliability re professionals must, villagers and frontline workers tackling disease must. All this means that we have to think about development um, in a different way, conceptually and practically. So, to re reiterate yet again my argument that if uncertainty is central, risk-based, control-orientated, managerial, technocratic, um, approaches um, around a, a fairly linear view of modernity and progress just don't work. Um, so what's the alternative? So the alternatives are being created, I've made the case, but what are the principles that I have, that come out across all of these examples? You may have different ones, but my list is as follows. First, and most obviously, responding to uncertainties requires flexible, adaptive responses, not fixed, standardised designs. Experiences of uncertainty will differ depending on who and where you are, making actually a, a much more situated perspective and diverse knowledge is central. Differentiated actions always need to be responsive to social difference, gender, class, age, location, etc. And cultural beliefs and lived experiences are central to that. Easily said, but too often forgotten. I think what comes across these examples too is that actually building collective solidarities for these responses to uncertainties is part and parcel of this story. And this is vital. It requires strong rooted institutions, effective local leadership, and an autonomy to uh, experiment and improvise and create new solutions. And this innovation, improvisation, creativity is, I think, really key. These emerge through what one might call flexible performances involving a whole variety of different actors with no predefined script. Again, very different to a top down version of development. Sharing, extending, multiplying these innovations is absolutely key. So those seem to me to be some of the key principles that emerge out of these practices that we observe. But what does this mean then for development and for our reimagining of broader futures? And this is where I will move towards the conclusion of the talk. As I've said, development, at least in its sort of post-1945 version, through aid, projects, investment, has been very much about control, increasing stability, eliminating risk. It's that idea, those ideas, which as I've said, have deep roots, um, in Western thinking at least, have colonized thinking and practice in different ways and become very much part and parcel of Western style models of development. A narrow view of the future, defined by a particular view of linear progress and modernity. So a very particular um, foreclosing of the future defined by a technocratic, technocratic imagination. But as I've said, this, this model of development that's, that we've created after 1945 in the West in particular is tangibly failing. We just have to look around ourselves around to see that. 
It's rooted in what Nancy Fraser has termed progressive neoliberalism over the past decades. And the premises of this vision have been increasingly challenged. And I think they're becoming more challenged and people are recognizing that challenge. Climate change, financial instability, mass migration, all of these features of the contemporary world are forms of uncertainty that are undermining that um, hegemonic vision. Now, of course, the response to this instability that people are facing is a sense of anxiety, of distrust, of expertise, of fear, and sometimes unrest. And we see this too in different parts of the world. But what then happens when there is this failure and this gap of Im imagination of, a, of the way that we have thought about development? What moves into, the, into this void? What moves into this void, of course, and we've seen this again, is the rise of you know, a particular form of nationalist, populist, authoritarian forms of, of politics that fill the space and offer the potential of certainty. They offer the potential of certainty, creating, a, in a way, a mythical past of stability and control. You only have to look at the narratives of right-wing populist uh, movements in Europe to see that. You can expand that to other settings the world over. But actually, by embracing uncertainty, I argue, can actually offer hope rather than this despair, distrust, anxiety, if we think about these alternatives and make them more central to our thinking and practice. And as I've mentioned, there are hints of these already. Hints in the, uh, the practices in as diverse a setting as a control room, energy supply system in California, and a pastoral herder in Kenya. And what are these? You know, I've said them before, but flexibility, mobility, network, sharing, mutuality, improvisation, experiment, practical knowledge, transparency. I could go on. You know the, you know the story here. These are some of the watchwords there that are really part and parcel of what people do and have to do in the face of uncertainty. So how to respond? How to counter this move by, as it were, claims to stability uh, when actually there are alternatives out there? And who is best positioned to do that responding, to improvise, to experiment, to adapt? I would suggest, and this comes from the argument of the work on pastoralism, is those who live in the most marginal settings often, who are forced because they have to live with and live from uncertainty, that this type of new imaginaries of development can emerge. That we have to le learn patiently with them uh, about how forms of flexibility and informality are reconstructing the nature of markets, the nature of states, the nature of governance arrangements, and so on. So what does this mean? Here's a diagram in very bright green. No, it's not so bright up there. It's very bright here. Um, what does this mean? How can we think of a new, more hopeful alternative that will fill that void and, and avoid... Uh, the dangers of either a reversion to a technocratic risk management approach or the capture of that space of uncertainty by regressive forces. I think this is a major intellectual and practical challenge and political challenge, of course. Now, this slide presents, perhaps rather simplistically, uh, two contrasting alternatives, what we call in the step, step center a vision of development that is around controlling transitions, managed, expert-led, top-down, the status quo, if you like, particular vision of modernist progress that's controllable risk, not unpredictable uncertainty, um, that's in, in essence of the, where we've been in a, in a slightly stylized, I have to say, way. So what's the alternative to that? What we would call in the step center caring transformations, here we, we situate uncertainty absolutely at the center. It's not about linear predictable transitions, it's multiple complex uncertain transformations. I won't go through the full list, you can read it. 
Because uncertainty is central, it's actually, the whole process is necessarily much more contested, much more political, much more unruly. It necessarily involves multiple plural knowledges and skills, diversity, flexibility, and so on, that I've mentioned before, totally uh, at the core. It's not dominated by fear and force, or narratives of crisis, of apocalypse, of catastrophe, of emergency, but it's where principles of care, conviviality, collectivity, commoning are more central. And I would argue that actually the principle, these sort of principles are the ones that we're seeing in the practical examples of where uncertainty is being uh, responded to effectively. So the right-hand side is not development, mainstream development as we know it, or at least we've known it since the 1960s. But it actually does, as I've suggested before, draw on much older traditions, philosophical and intellectual traditions, and of course, uh, in the West, have been subsumed by this technocratic, modernist version. But elsewhere, in other cultures, in other, uh, in other settings, uh, are more vibrant. And it links very directly, in our experience, with those practical, tacit knowledges of pastoralists and others, control room operators and others, who must confront uncertainty on a day-to-day -day basis. So, to wrap up now, yeah, genuinely to wrap up, um, what does this mean for Africa? Because I know the center CRC is focused on, on African futures, future rural Africa. Um, what does this mean for, for thinking about the African setting? And I don't want to sort of reify Africa as a sort of peculiar setting, because I think this actually, and I'll, I'll make this point, applies everywhere. But I think, in particular in African contexts, um, African contexts have been heavily dominated by that control-oriented form of development, imposed from colonialism through the post-colonial projects of structural adjustment and top-down investment and so on and so forth. The history of Africa is lit littered with failed projects of that form. Yet the type of uncertainties that people face in African settings that I know about um, a face daily. I mean, whether that's climate change or migration or financial instabilities or governance um, uh, upheavals, they're faced daily. That is the day-to-day -day experience of everybody. And these have shaped and are shaping the political economies and indeed ecologies across Africa. So coming back to my other argument, the argument that I introduced at the beginning and, and reinforced through our discussion of pastoralism, I think perhaps particularly in marginal areas outside the control of states and aid apparatus and so on, those living with those intersecting uncertainties are and have and necessarily have the capacities to adapt, improvise, perform, form collective solidarities and so on in ways that are deeply embedded. And again, this isn't a reification of sort of cultural um, specificities. This is just an argument of, of what people do and have to do. And as we've seen amongst pastoralists in Africa and beyond, these practices are just part of day-to-day -day life. And I think in thinking about possible African futures and the necessity of embracing uncertainty within those, opening the horizons of futures, not having them closed down towards a narrow vision of progress and modernity, we can think more positively about what African futures might be. Not a sort of foolish Africa rising narrative, but a pos much more positive one that is about uh, how knowledges and capacities deeply embedded in societies, often through very difficult settings, circumstances, um, can help. And more radically, I think, um, we can ask, can those insights earned over uh, in these contexts actually help confront uncertainty challenges elsewhere? Can, for example, African pastoralists that we work with, or farmers, or informal traders, or whoever, actually provide some key lessons and reverse, to some extent, that colonizing flow of knowledge and practice that has been development?
That's a provocation, and I'm not sure what the answer is, but I think there's something in there. So, as we embrace uncertainty as central, not something to be wished away, I've argued that it suggests a very different, more humble, but actually more hopeful perspective to progress in modernity, and a very different way of thinking about innovation, about sustainability, about development more broadly. And I want to quote, end with a quote from Rebecca Solnit that she included in her book, Hope in the Dark. She says, hope locates itself in the premises that we don't know what will happen and that in the spaciousness of uncertainty is room to act. When you recognize uncertainty, you recognize that you may be able to influence the outcomes, you alone or you in concert with a few dozen or several million others. Hope is an embrace of the unknown and unknowable, an alternative to the certainty of both optimists and pessimists. So we have to ask, should a politics of uncertainty lead, as I've said, to a risk-focused, controlling transition to a Western ideal through aid, adjustment, reform, or so on, and so on, or a more emancipatory, caring, hopeful future where visions of the future are opened up? In other words, Embracing uncertainty is vital for galvanizing action and so development and I would say, suggest it offers actually a much more positive view, uh, not only for Africa, but for everywhere else. So I'll finish there. Thank you.